All right. Thank you so much, Emma and Jasmine, for joining me today. How are you both? Good. Fantastic. <laughs> and Jasmine? Yeah. Yeah, really good. <laughs> so this will should be uh, an episode coming out hopefully next week or the week after. Um, just a quick introduction to you both. Um, would you like to quickly introduce yourself, Emma, um, who you are, which university you're from, and uh, what NTP experiences have you been through? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a uh, fifth year business uh, majoring economics and law student from Queensland University of Technology. Um, and so I did two NCP experiences, the first being um, a kind of uh, international kind of management and commerce project um, with the Bhutanese National Legal Institute um, in Bhutan. Um, which basically touched on a lot of social issues and that was mm. really great experience. And then secondly, I did a exchange semester in Hong Kong um, at City University of Hong Kong, which is really great as well. It's amazing. <laughs> Thank you for coming. And Jasmine. Uh, yeah, so uh, I just graduated actually, which is super exciting. Um, <laughs> I did a dual bachelor's in law with honors and international relations. Um, in terms of my NCP program, I was really lucky I was selected as the Thailand Fellow in 2018. Mm. Um, so I did an exchange semester in Thailand. And then as a part of that as well, I did two internships, um, one in the Philippines and one in Malaysia mm. um, with Austrade and the Australian High Commission, respectively. Wow. And well, I've, I've ha I have both of you on the podcast, but how, how, do you, how did you both meet? And uh, where did that relationship or friendship come from? <laughs> so we're both um queensland uh, alumni ambassadors mm. and so we met in canberra which was really fantastic um yeah and it was yeah really great and we got we got along with the other queensland yeah. ambassadors yeah and i think one night we even had a couple of wines in my hotel room <laughs> Jeez, if i remember right, like, that part out. getting ready for one of these <laughs> <laughs> this is correct <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome uh okay um just to uh, uh prior episodes i used to do these mini game icebreaker games at the end and that stoked a lot of conversation and i just thought to my head that maybe i should just start it off and then with that and then we could lead into um your experiences at ncp and then other topics as well Sounds so great. i'm just going to share my screen okay can you both see my screen by any chance? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I was actually uh, doing this activity the other week and it's like, what would you rather? It's like A or B and like no, no options are better or the other, but <laughs> it's just personal preference. So I'm just going to uh, start off with this one. So would you rather lose the ability to lie or believe everything you're told? yeah yeah how about emma how about you start off what would you do um, if you i think doing... it, yeah i i reckon a to be honest um <laughs> <laughs> it's good to be truthful um yeah but yeah. i think and I, and I probably would are on the side of the truth as opposed to um believing everything i'm told because i wouldn't want to be kind of that naive <laughs> <laughs> You'd lose in a lot of negotiations, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. <laughs> in case, yeah, negotiations definitely because you do law. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and no, Jasmine. Yeah, no, I I agree completely. Um, and it's more because the that second part, the believing everything you're told, is terrifying. Given all the yeah. stuff you can see on social media mm. and on questionable news outlets. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, there is no way I'd want to believe everything that I'm told. That I, I think that's really dangerous. Mm. <laughs> You're walking around the world with your eyes closed a little bit. I think. Yeah. yeah in the yeah. fake news era. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think that's the common answer so far. But I think we don't even. Sometimes we don't think uh, we uh, would need to lie, uh, or lying is ever an option. But I think it's uh, definitely telling the truth is always the better option, I think, in this case. Agreed. So, next one is, would you rather have unlimited international first-class tickets, travel, or any form of transportation, 
or never have to pay for food at restaurants? Mm. Um, How about you, Jasmine? Or yeah, you so I, I think I'd rather unlimited international tickets. Um, oh. Because, I mean, I, I love food. I'm a huge foodie. Um, and I also love cooking. But one of the things I found when I was traveling that often the best food I'd have was quite cheap food. Right? So, like, going to street the... Street food, street vendors. Exactly. And yeah. the places that have tiny little plastic crates or nothing to <laughs> sit on, right? Yeah. I found yeah. was often the better food. Um, so, if I could get to anywhere I wanted to go in the world mm. for free, I think I'd be able to experience so much more different kinds of food than I would if I was just trying to go to expensive restaurants or something like that. Great answer. Great answer. <laughs> and Emma? Yeah, well, I was, and my knee-jerk reaction was to say the, um, to say never have to pay for food, but I think you've convinced me otherwise. <laughs> I think <laughs> it's also, I think it probably is to say that the kind of the biggest expense a lot of the times um, is the travel. And mm -hmm. so if you can, if you can get rid of that as, as, the, as a cost factor, you can spend a lot of time going really cool places. So yeah, I, I'm mm -hmm. going to change my answer and go with A. <laughs> Bit of, bit of group think there, but that's all yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the last one is this one. Uh, would you rather be the CEO of any multinational company today or a ruler of a large country 2,000 years ago? Mm. I think as a female, I wouldn't necessarily want to go back 2,000 years. <laughs> um, not saying that things are perfect now, but I think we've had a yeah. lot of um, improvement. Also, having the power and responsibility to rule a large country kind of terrifies me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think as an M MNC today, we do have a little more power to influence people's social change in the world as a whole. Mm. You know what? I think I'm going to disagree on that one. I think <laughs> <laughs> for the first, I think that's yeah, incredibly important. I think also kind of being a CEO at the moment, um, there is a huge impact you can have, but maybe if you had the opportunity to be a, a ruler of a large country 2000 years ago, could have um, paved the way a little bit quicker for oh, some yeah. really Im important mm. things. Though I guess that is to point. say that, that, um, the people who kind of win in those situations, the ones that write history. So just make sure I've got a really um, strong army and all that kind of <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you win. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're thinking it through very detailed as well. Yes, the army. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> make sure to be the ones that write history. You know, we can change it. We can change the, the course of history as we know it, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and this is just, uh, oh, this is a, a picture, I believe, of uh, both of you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Canberra as well. And yeah, did you want to just explain uh, just uh, what, what was the story behind this picture and what you both were doing there? Do you want to go on my right? Yeah, um, I'm happy to go. You can add, yeah, whatever, whatever you're after. So basically, um, gosh, it was at the end of last year. Um, we had uh, we had the opportunity to travel to Canberra, which was really mm -hmm. awesome. Um, because we were selected to be uh, New Colombo Plan alumni ambassadors. Um, so the photo that you can see there is the Queensland cohort. And so I think there was about 50 or so ambassadors, alumni ambassadors um, from the whole of Australia. And basically we were there um, to workshop um, our, as to how we can promote the strategic goals for the NCP um, as alumni and it's been really fantastic. It was a great opportunity to meet incoming um, scholars as well as connect with alumni and um, figure out how we can uh, move, move the kind of NCP forward and um, yeah, and engage people. And it's yeah, really great, Andrew, that you're doing this particularly because this is an amazing opportunity to meet some really groovy people and yeah. <laughs> um, and learn about people's experiences because yeah, the NCP program has been kind of fundamental, I guess, in my life and um, everyone who's probably have done it as well. And it's a great opportunity to give back to the program as well. It's mm. great to hear. And Jasmine, did you have any um, stories or <laughs> anything uh, that you remember from that trip <coughs> yourself? Um, I can completely agree with everything Emma said. And it was so 
it was actually so fantastic to attend that event two years after I'd first attended. So um, when I was a scholar, um, we had the whole pre-training as well and we got to meet people that had gone previously. So it was actually fantastic to experience it from the other side and to see how much excitement was in the eyes of the scholars that are, well, unfortunately weren't quite able to go over. Um, but at that point, I believe they would be able to um, We were very starry-eyed, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Bushy tail as well. Yes. <laughs> uh, and also to share all of the different things I'd learned and um, while I was away and tips and tricks I thought would have been useful before mm. I went over there. Mm. Um, you know, that was, it was a really fantastic few days. Mm. That's awesome, T, and I guess that perfectly segues into, um, I'd love to hear about your, both of your stories for NTP. Uh, for with Emma going to Hong Kong and with Jasmine going to Thailand, um, yeah, did you want to just give us a little bit of like, insights and what, what you did whilst you were over there and what really stood out to you um, when, when you came back to Australia and what, what, what you took away from the experience? Uh, yeah, Emma or Jasmine. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy. Um, happy to start. So yeah. maybe I'll um, talk about Bhutan um, first, and then um, talk about Hong Kong if that's if that's all right, Andrew. So um, for Bhutan, um, yeah, as I as I said, that was basically um, an internship with the um, the Bhutanese National uh, Legal Institute, so the BLNI, and um, what we were doing um, was developing uh, community uh, capacity building workshops for uh, Bhutanese students and teachers, um, which focused on um, different areas. Mine specifically was about access to justice. So we spent um, around about a month in country um, when we had the and there we had the opportunity, of course, to work with the BNLI. Um, also Bhutanese judges, other officials, and probably my favourite, the um, Princess of Bhutan, we actually um, met, oh. which is pretty, pretty cool, yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, we, we actually had an afternoon tea in her house, which was That's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah, it, honestly, out of this world. She, um, she's got two little, two little boys, and one of them um, is... Um, is kind of moving in to be a, a monk and he was this yeah like I think maybe four year four year old little boy and mm. you should have seen him how he walked it was incredible it's just yeah it's an it's an incredible place um Bhutan kind of mm. wedged between in the Himalayan mountains um between China and India and yeah. I guess a lot of people know it for the um being like the birthplace of the growth national happiness um that index <laughs> but i don't think i don't think many people know about it um now we do <laughs> aside from that yeah <laughs> yeah and it's yeah oh gosh there's so many fun facts about bhutan honestly like yeah. they've got a um a monastery that we got to um uh that's was constructed on the side of a cliff that we got to hike along which is incredible they use it's um it's almost like a, a pilgrimage um that people do as well and another thing is that um they consider like chilies as, as vegetables, so you have to have a, a good chili <laughs> tolerance if you if you're going there or just uh. eat other plain stuff. But yeah, so that was incredible. Um, I really enjoyed that. So that was, I guess, the um, the starting point of my NCP experience. Um, mm. And then I got to go to uh, Hong Kong on an exchange semester at City U, um, and that was just incredible um i was part of the basketball team i um competed in some case competitions which we um got to we actually came third in the grand finals for which is really cool i think i was the only um only kind of western person which was interesting because we were doing something about um a traditional chinese medicine company so i think oh. having that that dual western yeah. um perspective was something that was really great and i learned a lot um did some model UN conferences, um, <laughs> just a lot of really fun stuff. Um, but probably I was talking um, before about it. I, I went to the Philippines at um, one point and got my advanced open um, water diving license, which was just an incredible experience because I wanted to go diving with fresher sharks. That's so that's why I decided to go to the Philippines. <laughs> but yeah, there's yeah, so many other amazing um, experiences as well. And it's yeah, it was incredibly incredibly just the best 
<laughs> and it, yeah, I would highly recommend, um, yeah, just taking advantage of going to all those places and, and doing that kind of stuff and getting involved actually, I think is a key part yeah. of it because it just makes, enriches your experience um, so much yeah. more, particularly yeah, talking to the locals. <laughs> You definitely didn't put on like the proposed plan visiting the princess of Bhutan's uh, <laughs> house, uh, debating or uh, debating about Chinese medicine and diving sharks. So that's, that's <laughs> that was just awesome to hear. Jasmine, did you say wanted to say something? Oh, I just said that I completely agreed um, with what Emma said about making the most of every opportunity that comes up while you're overseas, no matter how random or bizarre yeah. they potentially <laughs> seem. <laughs> yeah. Because that was even for the diving, my friend, I was, at, I was having um, noodles with my friend from Germany and she had her, I think, um, her master's diving license and was telling me about how the best places to go is, is Malapascu Island in the Philippines. And the next day I was able to kind of <laughs> book a flight and go. So, <laughs> yeah, mm, definitely taking amazing. the opportunities. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Jasmine, would you like to just... Um... Tell yeah. us a little bit about your plans as well. Yeah, I'll do it in a brief outline. So that I guess there were three parts to my um, NCP journey, trip, mm. experience, dinner. Um, <laughs> so basically I started off at Mahidon University in Thailand. Um, so that was my host country. Uh, and the great thing about Mahidon is that it's an international college, or there is an international college with inside the local university. Um, so it meant that all of my classes were taught in English, which was fantastic because before mm. I went there, I knew, knew no Thai, so I would have failed. Um, but it also meant that most of my classes were with, oh, well, all of my classes um, were with local students, mm. which was fantastic because um, it really gave me that, that local connection point. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I was able to experience so many different things with them than I would have if I just stayed within the like expat community of Thailand. Mm. Um, or just the exchange students. Um, and something, something that was really interesting there was we had to wear a uniform, um, oh. <laughs> which, was, <laughs> which was interesting to go back to after not being in a yeah. uniform for so many yeah. years. Wow. Um, it was a, yeah, your classic crisp white shirt with a little logo and a pin. Oh. Um, and then a black, um, black skirt, uh, generally to around the knee. Mm. Um, so, and, a, and, and everyone, a belt. You had to wear the had to wear. belt as well. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> but also, I, so the subjects I studied there, unfortunately, they didn't offer law subjects. Um, so I just did international relations ones. Um, and it was really cool to learn a lot of stuff I'd already, I guess, technically learn about in a academic way, but from a different perspective. Um, so, you know, to, to learn about their thoughts on diplomacy um, and on transnational crime and, and to see it from a completely different perspective um, was really eye-opening for me because often what you think at uni is that what you're taught is the truth, right? Or, or the absolute truth or definitely right. Whereas there are just so many different perspectives on things we classify as academic. Um, so it was, it was really interesting to see that, that different perspective. Mm. Um, I totally, I totally agree with that. I think that's a, yeah, really amazing. I did a um a financial markets course, and usually, if you did it, they did it at my university. It would be um, it would be from the Australian perspective, but we did the U.S., um, Chinese, and Hong Kong perspective as well. So yeah, that's yeah, really really interesting. Exactly, you see from new lenses you wouldn't wouldn't have otherwise yeah. necessarily thought about. Um, and then also while in Thailand, one of the big things for me was both travel and food as well. Um, so I got to experience some amazing cultural experiences. Like I went to the Yi Peng Festival, um, which is up north in Chiang Mai. So if you've seen the movie Tangled, when they release the lanterns into the sky, um, oh. it's like that, but in real life and mind blowing. <laughs> um, so the, night time the as well. Pardon? And night time as well, where it's yeah. just like, yeah. Exactly. So you put these candles in these, um, these paper lanterns. Um, so the heat makes it rise. Um, and the whole underlying concept is that you're putting in all the burdens of the year before um, and letting, it, letting them fly off, uh, mm. I guess. Um, and then people can also write hopes for the coming year on the lanterns. Um, so just being able to see things like that in person was fantastic. Um, and in terms of food, I would eat anything and everything that I could, irrelevant of what I was, whether I knew what it was. 
Um, but I do have an allergy to eggs and nuts, including peanuts, which is interesting in Thailand. Because everything uh, has that. <laughs> yeah. So most of the time, I would just say, my say kai, my say toa, which just means no eggs and no nuts. And I wouldn't know what it is that I'm eating. I just know that it won't give me an anaphylactic reaction. Yeah. Um, so I tried some <laughs> wonderful things that were on sticks and skewers. Also tried blood soup. Um, which is called Nam, Nam Tok, if I remember rightly. So it's called Waterfall. Um, mm. Why? I'm not quite sure, but that was an interesting experience too. <laughs> um, and uh, I guess I'll move on from Thailand. Um, mm. So after that, I went to the Philippines. Um, I was based in Manila and I interned with Austrade there. Um, so for people who don't know, Austrade is a company that is kind of both private and government based. Um, so it is a government agency, but they do take paying clients. Hmm. Um, and it's all about integrating Australian business into that country where the, the office is based and vice versa. So getting um, Filipino countries into Australia. Oh, sorry, Filipino companies, not countries, into Australia. Um, and that was an amazing experience for me. Um, and one of the big reasons was that I guess I'll talk about it more later. Um, but my whole team was female, um, which was absolutely amazing um, and it was even female up the hierarchy um, so getting to have that experience on top of all the other internships I was internship things I was getting to do yeah. um, was was really really fantastic and really inspiring hmm. um, and so while I was there the work I was doing was some of it was the with the Asian Development Bank um, some was more locally based some was other work for the embassy so Austrade works within the embassy mm. um and yeah again just getting to see things from a from a new perspective and a different perspective um and i also became really close friends with my co-workers and through that i was actually able to volunteer uh, at some rural communities um which uh, so this um this volunteer group was actually run by one of my co-workers and they provided medical um, so like dentists, um, as well as general checkups and pharmaceuticals, mm. um, uh, as well as education and things like passport photos, you know, small stuff. Um, so yeah, that was, that was a fantastic opportunity as well. Um, to feel that I was, I guess, getting to give, give back a bit, but also just to be able to see, cause you see Manila is so different from the rest of the Philippines. Um, so to be able to break that city, city boundary. Um, mm. was fantastic. Mm. Uh, and then I guess to the, the last place I went, that was Malaysia, um, Kuala Lumpur. So again, quite a big city, um, <laughs> if not huge. Uh, and there I was with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in the High Commission. Um, mm. I was part of the political and economic sector in the public diplomacy and policy support. Uh, it's all a bit of a mouthful. Um, but that was great for me in the way that Public diplomacy is one of the areas I'm most interested in, in terms of international relations and future career. Um, so to be able to do an internship that was so directly in line with mm. what, what I want to be doing is fantastic. Um, but again, also getting to be in a place that is such a melting pot of cultures. Yep. Um, so there are three major cultures that are all quite prominent in Malaysia. Yep. Um, and just seeing how that influenced the society and the way things were run in terms of even the food and the different cuisine. Um, and yeah, that was quite different because obviously in Australia, we're super, super multicultural, but the cultural, there is still quite a clear cultural dominance, I guess, with, with Australia yeah. as a whole, whereas it's, yeah. it's relatively balanced in Malaysia. And depending on which area you go to, you can see really strongly um, those different cultures reflected in both like local law, um, as well as just, yeah, food and, and community, um, which mm. was just really amazing. <laughs> just listening to both of your experiences uh, i'm just amazed but also super super duper jealous at the moment um, as well <laughs> um, yeah i think the common theme that i'm just getting from both of your stories and your experiences are that uh, the change of perspectives and um or, or the, even though both i'm assuming both of you like knew that it was going to be a different way of life different way different people different cultures and business um, businesses uh, like in Australia, uh, like you both are 
or Jasmine's in Melbourne right now. Emma, you're in Brisbane at the moment as Brisbane, well? Brisbane, yeah, yeah. Like, there's not much difference. Like, okay, I'm not going to say there's not much difference between <laughs> the three cities, Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane, but going to a different country, like Bhutan, going to Hong Kong, going to Philippines, and, and vice versa with you, Jasmine, as well. Um, was there anything that really, like, shocked you and stood out when you, uh, when you like, were just working there, interning um, in Bhutan, Emma, or... Uh, yeah. working in Malaysia or like that you didn't quite expect but was just something that was a very nice shock to the system that you later have sort of just been happy that you discovered yeah I think what we were talking about um, a little bit earlier was the fact that you have to be um, so willing and able to adapt and be agile um, it's probably the buzzword because <laughs> um like they say they have a they have a phrase for it in Bhutan it's like Bhutanese stretchy time um and it's it's just to say that things um even if you if you do all the planning you do all the preparation things don't necessarily um pan out in that particular way and so you have to be um able to adapt to whatever the situation is and that's something that I think um even I guess Australian people oh, Australian culture is relatively laid back maybe compared to other uh, countries but I guess even Australian culture compared to Bhutan stretchy time is just worlds apart and I think that it, it was an incredible experience to um, to do that and to be able to adapt particularly when you're in such a different environment and yeah do you have any kind of comments on that one as well Jasmine? <laughs> yeah look I'd, I'd completely agree um, I've got I'm, I'm was someone that before I went I needed everything to be organized before I did anything, before I went everywhere, I'd have planned out where I was going, how I was getting there, what train I'd be getting at what time and contingencies. Um, and in when I went to Thailand, I had to completely let that go. I had to learn how to let that go. Because um, no matter how much I planned, it, it would never turn out to that. And I found out if I planned it too much, then I'd get stressed about it not going to plan. So it was better to have a more laid back approach while still obviously having a general idea what's going on. Um, rather than getting anxious about it. And I think a perfect example is uh, at one point I went, I was staying on one island and then had to get across the mainland to, to get to the, um, a different island where I was staying the next night or planning on staying the next night. I think I should um, <laughs> <laughs> preface. <Clarify>. So, <laughs> so we're on the first island just after the um, full moon party. So that was, that was quite, quite a big experience in itself. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're trying to get across to a more quiet, less visited island. Um, I was traveling with one other friend. Um, and we realized at about 11 o'clock in the morning that to get the ferry that we needed to get, it was going to be an hour after uh, when we thought it would be, meaning we weren't going to make the train we thought we needed to get to then be able to get the last shuttle to the town on the other side to then be able to get the, the last ferry to get to that second island. <laughs> um, so there was a bit of panic there. Yeah, so a lot yeah. going on. <laughs> um, going through my head. <laughs> <laughs> so in the end, I think we ended up getting four or five different forms of transport that night, oh, that day. And oh, yeah. we ended up staying at the town before the island um, the night and then traveling early in the morning. So basically what we did is we got the ferry, then from the ferry got a bus. From the bus, we got a train that would get us closer to that town, but wasn't the original train we wanted to get. Mm. From there, it was maybe about nine o'clock when we decided to hire um, a moped um, <laughs> and ride about <laughs> three or four hours down wow. um, along highway and then also Dover. So basically along the border of where of Thailand and Myanmar. Mm. Um, so riding all the way down there to a, the town called Renong and we ended up arriving at about 1 a.m accommodation I booked just before we got on the motorbike to start that trip um, and that was one of the best experiences that I had as hectic and crazy as it was that's when it really clicked to me that it is it was better to just go with the flow and accept that things are going to happen differently than I thought they would um, and yeah it was a huge changing point for me in terms of uh, where my mindset was at <laughs> 
I think, yeah, it's really important as well. It's trusting in the locals too, I think is something that's a really, really great as well, because the, the amount of people that are so willing um, to help you irrespective of um, where you are or, or what you're doing is, I just, I find incredible. I was um, saying to Jasmine before, um, when I arrived in Hong Kong, I just, I didn't really do the whole kind of prep, um, what train I need to be on and everything, which is, a little bit ironic given that that was my first touchdown in country um <laughs> but it was it was it was quite easy I did I did kind of trust in that but um what happened was I I got off of the train station and it was and it looked like a shopping center and I was kind of quite confused by that but I was in the right location but there was a student at the university that I was um studying at that saw me I think recognized that I was a lost, <laughs> a lost, lost um, Aussie. <laughs> yeah, a lost international student that probably should have checked beforehand. Yeah. Um, but she took me all the way through the campus, even gave me a little bit of a tour and oh. virtually logged me, got me into my room. Um, and then said, I said, Oh, thank you so much. I'll take you for dinner. And she goes, no worries. And then she just walked away. <laughs> it was just it was amazing. And I, yeah, I think that is, yeah, trust and go with the flow and, and mm. trust in, in the situation, but also, be willing to ask for help and people mm. always kind of give you help. It's, it's amazing. It's, yeah, it's really, really great. Mm. Yeah. Like I think I've just speaking to other scholars. I think the, like, the common theme as well was that uh, a lot of things w were planned, but then it was, didn't go to plan if that made sense. And another one was being able to live out of their own suitcases and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, did you, yeah, for, for both of your experiences, uh, like, it sounds all very linear and very straightforward, but I'm sure there must have been a lot of mishaps and things that you did not plan, but those were the experiences and the memories that you would take back and really, you know, look up, look like, look back on, so. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't even have my internships organized before I left. Um, so I, I knew what you knew I was going to, but other than that, it was, it was up in the air where the rest of my program was going. Um, and that was something I was really stressed about before I went, but I realized while I was there, so I, I got both of the internships organized while I was in Thailand. Um, and that, that, that was fine. I didn't need to have it all prepared in advance. Um, and different opportunities came up. Whereas if I'd settled for something else earlier, that wasn't exactly that I, what exactly what I wanted, I wouldn't have necessarily gotten those other opportunities. And I think it's it's to say as well that there is kind of the snowball butterfly effect as well, because as, as soon as you start talking to people and meeting different people, the opportunities just compound on, on one another. And I found that particularly um, in Hong Kong with all of the um, kind of the clubs and, and different things that I was involved in, mm -hmm. um, it, it just made for an even more enriched experience and you can really find your people which is which is amazing as in you find the people that want to do debating with you or want to do model UN conferences and then and then you can yeah it's 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 amazing yeah no exactly well I, I think a perfect example is I um there was a, an event hosted for the end oh this is a funny story I had to just so <laughs> an event hosted for um all NCP scholars mobility or or um or scholar by the Thai embassy. Yeah. Um, so it's just supposed to be like a short afternoon tea thing. So we've gone. Um, and so from there, I actually met this um, amazing woman who works for and was the head of Relief Web, which is a United Nations um, information service. Mm -hmm. um, but the funny bit of this story was that we were all standing there chatting and then slowly we've noticed all the official people had left from the embassy. And then suddenly the fountains got turned off and the lights got turned off and we realized we couldn't open the front door, <laughs> the building we were in. So we were locked inside the embassy yeah. for a solid 30 to 45 minutes <laughs> um, before a, um, a diplomat who was just staying late that night came in and was like, well, what are you guys doing here? We were, we're not quite sure. And we're a little <laughs> bit stuck. Um, just yeah, so that was, <laughs> that was an interesting experience. But in terms of the opportunities compounding from there, um, yeah. that woman I met with Relief Web um, actually offered me an opportunity. I volunteered with them um, remotely um, to organize an interactive seminar with the inaugural 
Youth Peace Summit. I think I've, I think I'm missing a word in there. It's quite a long title. <laughs> um, but yeah, people so you'll, exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, you'll, you'll never know where you're going to meet people that'll give you your next opportunity. Hmm. Yeah, I was, I was briefly in Vietnam um, in February this year. Uh, I was supposed to go to a, it was a, like a conference and then I was like volunteering in a rural area um, sort of uh, activity, uh, but that was cancelled because of COVID, unfortunately. Um, so I just spent the rest of my time um, basically just uh, relaxing and enjoying mm -hmm. Vietnam. And I just decided to reach out to another NTP scholar who was actually there at the time. And I was, I was reaching out to other connections as well. And then I just realized that uh, be, well, being in Sydney, I felt quite detached in some ways uh, to the community because I felt like it was really big. There was just so much that I didn't know. But when I was in Vietnam, I think like one connection was happy to introduce me to another connection. And that connection brought me along to another event. And then I met a lot of people at that event. And it felt like this a community, a community that was very not small, but very, uh, like everyone sort of knew each other from, oh yeah, I I've met that person uh, from here, here or there. And it was just really nice. I think just um, having a lot of that um, interaction um, in my brief time in Vietnam, but I can only imagine that compounding in during your time being there for six months, a year or even more. And yeah. And also the NCP community as a whole, hmm. it, it's that, some was a seven degrees of connection or something like that you'll yeah. meet so many people that'll happen to know someone else that you know through ncp or because they ran into them in country like um one of your last guests one high um mm. we ended up meeting each other in um the philippines because she <laughs> happened to be interning there with a different company yeah. um and it was by happy chance we'd met each other too because i didn't know she was in country and she didn't know i was in country <laughs> but then we got a um, cause I was working in the embassy. She'd been invited to an event mm. as an NCP scholar. And I was like, wait, there's an NCP scholar here. Um, <laughs> yeah. So then we ended up catching up in country and oh. same was when I was in, um, Thailand, I would reach out to, to other scholars that were there, mm. like through the Facebook groups and stuff. Mm. I think how, um, connected the NCP community is, is fantastic. Mm. Completely agree with you. Uh, and Emma, did you have anything to add or? Yeah. Oh, well, I, yeah, just probably echo exactly yeah. what you guys are saying. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's how it, I feel like that's how it works. It's kind of like a, like a spider web. As soon as yeah. you meet someone, they'll know someone and then you'll meet someone else. And mm. um, it's really interesting as well, because those relationships that you form, I uh, particularly overseas, I, I feel like they can become such long standing, valuable um, friendships, um, working relationships, um just peers of people that have a common interest and i think the common interest really is is wanting to experience the world and be a, a global citizen and i think that it's you yeah, meet some really really amazing people both the locals other international students and of course kind of the ncp community so mm. yeah i think that that is a, a top tip to kind of really go and want to talk to people and because you'll find that you'll kind of make the greatest friendships and all, all the rest. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point, actually. Um, and I would like to ask you both one final question about the NCP. Uh, what was the, obviously you've made hundreds, if not thousands of friendships uh, over the time, <laughs> but what was like one uh, friendship or that the person, a person that you met that you really, uh, like you really uh, remember and really, uh, yeah, just, uh, took back um, to Australia and just really cherished that friendship a lot. So you didn't have to mention their name. It's fine. But it just, did you want to share how that um, friendship started and yeah, what, what both of you shared during that time? I'm happy to start if, if you'd like. Yeah. So um, in Hong Kong, you live in residency hall. So I was in hall nine um, and on, there's a common, a common area. And I found that I spent a lot of time in the common area um, mainly because the internet connection was best there. Um, but aside from that, I just loved seeing people walk through and um, getting to know the people um, on my particular level. And I made really great friends um, with an international student. So she was from, uh, or is from, sorry, Malaysia. And so she would invite me to go to 
these different Malaysian events and she was just such a great a great person to get to know and so I met all of her friends and and kind of broadly and um well she's a beautiful artist as well and um I really have kind of this obsession with sunflowers and um when I was leaving literally the day, the day that I was leaving um there was a little kind of envelope under my door and she had oh. drawn me this amazing picture of a sunflower <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah it, it was yeah it was incredible and it's um and she had a quote on there that um I really like as well so it was um uh despite knowing they won't be here for long they still choose to live their brightest lives and that's sunflowers so yeah that really was very meaningful to me and one of yeah probably the most memorable um friendship that I made Oh, that's Amazing. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yourself, Jasmine? Yeah, I mean, it's it's difficult the three different experiences to to try and pick a, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think one of the most meaningful ones for me was in the Philippines. Um, so one of my coworkers, um, she is just the most amazing person. I have never met someone so selfless. Um, but so basically, our friendship first started. Uh, in the office because we shared a, a divider, a wall divider. Um, and then, uh, so my first week in the Philippines, um, she invited me over to her place with some of her friends and some of our co-workers for a, what was supposed to be a brunch. Um, cut to a bottle of tequila later and 9 p.m. <laughs> um, it, was, it was a fantastic um, bonding experience. Mm. And then with her, I got to go um, to a... Um, beautiful art and music festival um, on an island. Um, and I've kept in great contact with her and her, her partner. Um, and I actually went to visit them again after I'd moved to Malaysia. Mm. Um, I'd, I'd booked just a, a short weekend trip um, to, to go and stay with them. And yeah, Grace was just so instrumental in feeling comfortable in the Philippines as well as showing me new opportunities and experiences. And yeah, just she makes, she makes everyone feel welcome. Um, and uh, still in contact now. Um, recently had a video call for a mutual friend's birthday party. Um, we did like a Zoom birthday party event, um, which, was, which was super cool. Uh, well, well, that's, yeah. I think it is cliche, but it is quite true that a lot of the things, uh, experiences that you go through uh, really made, the difference is made with the people that you meet and the friendships that you create, so. Absolutely. Amazing to hear. Amazing to hear from both of your experiences. And um, just to segue from what um, Jasmine just said about um, from her experience in the Philippines and working with, uh, I think it was the volunteering group. They was all led by, I believe it was all women. Uh, yeah. So Austrade was all women. Austrade, Austrade. Sorry. And yeah, I think just going from that topic and like, how was that experience working in a team of all women and, um, yeah, what, what really stood out and what did you learn from that experience? Yeah, it was, it was super eye-opening. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if many people know, but the Philippines is actually, it's really high in terms of, or ranked really highly in terms of um, females in business or women in business. Mm. Um, so they're actually ranked first in the Grant Thornton International 2020 Women in Business Report um, for the most number of female executives in top leadership roles. Wow. Um, so being in that environment was fantastic. But in terms of being in a part of an all-female team, um, it taught me to be a lot more assertive. Uh, something I'd, and it was only a persona I'd only noticed while I was over there, was that I, in an office space, I take on quite a um, reserved or, or timid or even um, a little, uh, cutesy is maybe the word. Um, <laughs> rather than being assertive with my ideas. Um, so being a part of such a strong female team um, really taught me that it's okay as a woman to be assertive in, in the office, um, which is something I'd always conceptually known, um, but how to go about it um, was quite different. Seeing it in practice as well. Exactly. Um, and as I said, the, it wasn't just my office that was female in Austrade. Um, but it also was up the hierarchy. So the um, head of the Indo-Pacific was female and the CEO of Austrade at the time was also female. Um, so being just part of a strong female chain was really inspiring. Yeah. Um, and a reminder that we can be whatever we want to be. 
Um, and even if there is a glass ceiling, we can, well, no, there is a glass ceiling, but we can smash through it. <laughs> mm. And with, particularly with the Philippines, was there any, like, is there a, a culture that is quite conducive and to having a lot of uh, women in leadership or is there that, or yeah, what, what's the defining distinction of, with having, with the, with the Philippines in that regard? Yeah, look, honestly, that's something that puzzled me quite a lot um, because yeah. socially there are still are a lot of um, disparities between, between men and women in the Philippines, um, particularly in terms of things like sexual harassment and, the, and those kinds of, of, of key issues. Um, but I think it's that in schools, women aren't taught to be less in any way, if that makes sense, than their male counterparts. Um, education is seen as extremely important and particularly for women. Um, and another big thing is it's never been, oh, okay, never is probably a, a, a bit of a strong word, but in recent times, um, it's not seen as negative for women to be the owners of a household, um, uh, which, is, which is something that I saw as, as, as quite different um, than other places I'd been, which was good. But yeah, it was, it was a, because of those social issues that were still very much present um, and some of them are a bit more present than they are in Australia. It was a, an interesting thing to see how women could excel so well in business, but there was that still those underlying issues. Mm. I think that if I'd, if I'd add to that, I think that for me, um, the, the pipeline in terms of schooling was something that I saw particularly um, in Bhutan that I thought was really fantastic because the um, students that we were um, working with were prospective uh, law students um, and they were going into um, the newly founded law school that the princess actually was played an kind of in instrumental part in establishing. Um, she was, she's also um, uh, Ivy League law school educated, the princess of Bhutan. I found that it was it very much where if they, if from a young age, if they can see those role models um, going through that, that is really instrumental. And I guess that works in your experience as well, having um, people at different levels, having that experience and, and being um, women, uh, having those kind of trailblazers is something that I, that I think is um, really instrumental in allowing people to kind of think that that's but even in a possibility and I guess never self-selecting out at that point as well. Mm. Yeah. And with, with Emma, with your experience um, working in the legal profession as well in Bhutan, um, was there anything that you saw experienced that was, uh, I guess there is the involvement from the monarch and the woman in leadership in that sense, but was there anything that really stood out to you um, with that regard? Yeah, well, uh, aside from there being really fantastic um, young women, uh, part of the kind of workshops as the students, um, as I kind of, I said a little bit earlier, we had the opportunity to meet a lot of the judges and there was one mm. particular judge that we met um, who was absolutely instrumental in their legal system and just listening to her speak and listening to the um the the ways that she was able to handle that was incredible and it's it's interesting as well um particularly given that it's a very different legal system in the sense of the way that they do things um it's great to see that there is definitely representation at that kind of top level um though i would say it is um uh probably a bit disproportionately skewed um to being male judges and um and, and things like that. You can definitely see the influence of the really kind of quite influential women, particularly that one judge that I was referring to. So I guess that was um, really, really great to see and, and quite inspiring as well. And yeah, the princess, as I said, she's she just <laughs> the coolest person ever. Yeah, she didn't even, I think when she was um, studying at the, at the Ivy League, she didn't even tell anyone that she was a princess and just, <laughs> and just did it. <laughs> I don't think anyone yeah. would believe I'm just a princess. It's like <laughs> of uh, a princess, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is yeah, pretty groovy. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Hmm. And I, I guess Jasmine touched on it as well about what she took out from um, that experience of being a lot more assertive um, now, being in Australia. 
Uh, was there anything that you took out from that, um, uh, those experiences that you would take on with you in the future when you enter the workforce, the, the corporate world, if you're going to go that way, or the legal profession or NGO profession or the public sector? What, what would you take from those um, experiences and really adopt into the future? Yeah, well, I think it's 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 been a clear um, common thread I've found throughout all of this experience and um, and broadly is um, I think I mentioned it before um, never to self select out always to put your hat into the ring and and um, and go for it I think I I was listening to this great TED talk it was it was saying um, don't fake it until you make it uh, fake it until you become it and I think what happens a lot of the time is people don't think that they're able to do it. So they don't even, don't even put themselves out there. And mm. I think that I've been, I've been quite lucky. I have really fantastic role models. I work in an in-house um, legal team at an engineering company at the moment. And we have really great senior legal um, uh, women who, who do a fantastic job. So I think I've got plenty of, of amazing mentors in, in my life, particularly women, but I think it's about having, faith in yourself that you can um do things and i think that the more that you put your hand up um mm. the more you have the opportunity um to to get it and give it a go <laughs> yeah, I, I completely <laughs> echo that that is that is so true and i remember reading it, it was a couple of years back so the statistics might not still be the same but it was that women will only or majority of women will only apply for jobs if they fit 80 percent of the criteria um, whereas generally the survey said among men, they would apply if they only, you know, 40 to 40 to 60 percent of the criteria. Hmm. Um, and yeah, self-selecting out is, is a huge issue. Um, like and and feeling like an imposter, um, imposter syndrome hmm. um, is also one of those those big concerns, um, for particularly a lot of women uh, in business um, and in the workforce. And yeah, just being able to tackle that and remind yourself that you do deserve to be there. Um, that you haven't just gotten there by chance um, or they picked you by accident, um, you know, that you, that you weren't to be there um, and that you don't have to either think you're not worth it or have to prove yourself. Um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's really important. Um, and I, again, one of those things that, that was a takeaway from some of the experiences that I had. Yeah, both of your points are actually really interesting with Emma's point, like being the common quote of being fake it till you make it, um, I think is n not, not entirely correct. I, I, some, I've heard I of, I, I, can't, I can't remember. Yeah. I can't remember the speaker, but he said, uh, don't fake it till you make it. Just show your journey of mm -hmm. like actually the struggle that you're going through. Um, and then use that as, um, like a document, a documentary documentation. And then when you actually reflect on uh, in, the, in the future, when you actually do make it, yeah. um, people will then use that, um, that documentary or that documentation as like inspiration that, that they're not at this alone, um, okay. that you don't have to fake it. Um, everyone else has, everyone else is doing it tough like you. Yeah. So. Exactly. And one yeah. of the things I think fake it also portrays is that you, you know, you shouldn't be afraid to ask questions. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and you have to, uh, otherwise, otherwise you won't either be able to complete the job the way it needs to be done. That's right. That's um, right. or you won't grow. Um, which, yeah, I found key cause I was thrown into so many different things I'd never done. A big part of Austrade is business. I don't have a business background. Um, <laughs> so there was, there was a lot of question asking going on and I'd mm. constantly have a book where I just jot down different questions I'd have when I'd have the opportunity to ask someone. Mm. Yeah. And having the confidence, I think to do that as well, it, it's part of it. So that you you know that you can do that and you you feel yeah you feel that you you can and you can express yourself and, and talk to people because yeah as we as we were saying before as well people are so willing and able to help you so it's about taking advantage of that too exactly yeah and, uh, and what jasmine said about the uh the job criteria point was really interesting um i've heard it somewhere as well where um not just job uh, applications but just in in the job themselves mm. like men would would I guess overplay what they're able to do and capable of to doing uh, whilst women have to be a lot more sure of themselves to actually do it uh, I'm going through that right now as well because I'm actually applying for jobs and sometimes I do uh, self-doubt myself because um, I am applying for like my first um, I guess 
full-time role or grad role so I'm mm. upon graduating. So uh, there is that uh, aspect of it because, yeah, I think when you see like something like you need two to three years or five years experience. Um, and then I actually called the person that was, um, that wrote the, wrote the job description or is a part of the HR team. They said, just put in your application. You never know what would happen. Um, your, your, your value as a student um, just can't be underplayed or, or a graduate can't be underplayed with experience. Sometimes you're a better fit um, compared to someone that has more years experience. So yeah, just a lot to learn and a lot to yeah. take in. And I think as well, being, being genuine and um, really being able to describe how you're unique has been something that I've found that has mm. been incredibly helpful because people are interested in you as a person and your experiences and the perspective that um, brings to the table. So yeah, it's exactly. never, never self-selecting out. <laughs> it <laughs> seems to be the case, even if you have to have, if you're meant to have five years experience. <laughs> mm. Mm. But also, yeah, being completely honest in your shortcomings as well or where, right? Like um, people, people are great and naturally picking up when someone is fake um, or they feel that something's a bit off about someone. Mm. Um, so it's, it's so important, as you said, to, Emma, to, to, be, to show your uniqueness and, and be honest. Um, and yeah, it's a big quality. I think a lot of people look for people admitting where they fall short um, because it one shows like self-reflection, um, but two, like a willingness to, to learn and change it. Yep. Wow. Uh, <laughs> got deep just really quickly, just yeah. there. Very, very reflective as well. Uh, okay. So uh, we want self-reflection yeah. is yeah. key. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me just, just check the time. Do, do both of you have to leave soon? If not, I'll, I'll just um, end it soon as well. Uh, yeah, when, whenever works for you. Uh, probably around 6.15, I need to bounce because okay. I need to dinner for the family. <laughs> it's all right. I, I think I'll end it here soon. I'll, I'll, I'll end it right now as well. Yeah, I'll cut that whole awesome. part out. It's fine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so thank you so much, uh, Jasmine and Emma, for th those insights and those stories. I, yeah, I can't can imagine what how much you've learned and all the things that the insights that you've gained just from not simple trips, but obviously there were a lot going on with those trips, but it's great to hear your stories and um, I hope that your endeavors in the future, either in the workplace or outside of the workplace, um, go well. So thank you so much for doing this. Really thank you, Andrew. We really, yeah, yeah really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. See you guys. All right, thank you.